For number one, on reproductive, reproduction day two, I wanted changes in reproductive hormones through time during the estrus cycle and pregnancy. So this is time here. And here's the end of the previous pregnancy or of a previous uh, failed pregnancy when there was no successful fertilization for GnRH with higher concentration. And what the, the graph should show is initially higher. And there is this slope here, but it should actually be up higher and then down like this. Uh, and these are the... So there's a, there's a reason why on a, a lot of medical textbook figures they show it more like this. That's because the GnRH is actually, what's important is the surge frequency, not the actual concentration. And so GnRH is actually secreted in these surges periodically in a human every several hours. And what matters is how close together the surges are. And so the average amount doesn't change that much, but the surge frequency changes. We represent that with this decline instead of this. Uh, the, that goes down and that corresponds to also a decrease in LH and FSH. Again, in LH in particular, it's the surge frequency, or rather not surge, but um, small pulse frequencies. So these are small pulses. This is the surge. The pulses would be much smaller. If we, if we could see the pulses, they would be doing this on the scale of the surge because it's so much higher. Anyway, you get these small pulses of LH, you get a decrease over time, you can think of it as content, and then here is the LH surge. Surge is happening because at some point the threshold for estrogen gets high enough uh, as the follicles are growing and producing more and more estrogen, it gets high enough to trigger positive feedback on the GnRH neurons, so you get a rise in GnRH, you get a rise in LH, even more estrogen, even more estrogen gives you even more GnRH, even more LH, and so on until you get the surge. That surge causes ovulation, so now the ovum is out and the corpus luteum switches over from producing mainly estrogen to producing mainly progesterone. That progesterone maintains the uterine lining, and if the uh, animal is, if the female gets pregnant, then the, um, then chorionic gonadotropin from the ovary will help to maintain the corpus luteum. It triggers continued production of progesterone and keeps the corpus luteum active and healthy. If there's no embryo, there's no CG, and at that point, the um, corpus luteum needs chorionic gonadotropin, so progesterone goes down and we start a new cycle. Here is that in relation to what's going on here with fertilization right here. Here is the surge, LH and FSH going down. Again, these would be tiny little pulses here, and then this gigantic surge, tiny little pulses of LH here, and then the gigantic surge. Uh, LH and FSH uh, rise, and if there's a pregnancy, or in the early stages before there, the progesterone coming from the corpus luteum here that inhibits kisspeptin negative neurons, that inhibits GnRH, which of course means you also have, sorry, inhibits GnRH down here. So that also means you have low LH and FSH. So chorionic gonadotropin, CG, is inhibiting kiss negative neurons, which are required to um, release kisspeptin to GnRH neurons at this stage. So you have low GnRH, therefore low LH and FSH. That means uh, oops, that means no new follicles develop. And as long as the progesterone is high enough, that progesterone is feeding back to inhibit GnRH. I wanted to sketch showing what a testis might look like. So within a testis would be all these little tubules, seminiferous tubules. And if we zoomed in on one of those, we would see here is the tubule there would be these support cells that are helping the, um, the, that are supporting the developing spermatozoa, they're spermatids in this stage. Down here would be the stem cells, spermatocytes, that would then, uh, spermatogonia, that would then divide into spermatocytes and finally develop into sperm. 
So early spermatids, you didn't need all of this information, but there would be stem cells down in here. So the stem cells shown here, which is fine, but they'd actually be down here around the epithelial tissue around the outside. Then between all these seminiferous tubules are these little patches of other cells that are secreting uh, not LH, but testosterone. So So LH secreted from the anterior pituitary, LH would bind on receptors here, and that's what's triggering the production. So LH binding here, and that triggers the production of testosterone in a male. And over here is structures of sperm with the head. Here is the acrosome would be in here, filled with enzymes. Uh, there'd be a nucleus in here, so the nucleus would be there. And then different parts of the flagellum, a thicker part here that's loaded with mitochondria, and then a part that's got a collagen sheath around it, and then finally an end that is sticking out just, just the flagellum. And uh, neck or mid piece is fine. Events of fertilization. Here is a sperm binding to a, the sperm binding protein on the egg. Here is the egg recognition protein or egg binding protein on the front of the spermatozoa. Binds, it, this is actually a G protein coupled receptor. So that triggers this G protein coupled receptor to release a G protein. Uh, shown here, binding to a denlite cyclase converts to cyclic AMP, which then binds to a calcium channel and calcium comes in. Now the real one is a little different. It actually uses inositol phosphate, IP, which is a different second messenger system, but um, it may be that in some animals it uses this. In any case, uh, the concept is correct. That calcium then does a couple of things. One is that wave of calcium helps to trigger the beginning of development. And so development would start. Uh, at this stage it's not using FSH or LH, so these hormones uh, are not relevant here. Uh, the calcium would bind to calcium binding proteins on these vesicles that have all these highly hydrophilic molecules in here. So that's GAGs or GAG-like molecules. There's a lot of glycoproteins in there. Once they're released, as long as there are aquaporins here somewhere, the water will come in. These expand tremendously and they push that membrane up and they create a, create a barrier that the next sperm cannot get through. And this whole thing only takes about 20 to 30 seconds. Here's another sketch showing essentially the same thing. Here are our egg recognition and binding proteins. Zooming in down here, we have the sperm. Here's the G protein coupled receptor. The calcium coming in, calcium binding to synaptic tagmin, the calcium binding protein here on these vesicles and releasing these gags or gag-like molecules swells with water and the space fills. And the whole thing takes only 20 to 30 seconds. The nucleus gets in and then the nucleus starts the next process here. This is another one. I just included it just to show there were more ways to um, do the same events. And so here's the actual, this person was showing the release of the ova, and then down here showing some of those other events. Um, what I really wanted was these sketches here, but I also want you to know this. And I accepted other variants like this as well. So this was a problem. An individual animal produces sperm that have tails containing a higher amount of collagen. So, so surrounding this part of the flagellum for a good part of the length is a collagen sheath. And what that collagen sheath does is when this, the tail bends, it provides uh, some elastic recoil to send it back. So we need the dynein to cause the bending, and then elastic recoil will help to bring it back. And it helps with the swimming motions. So if you have a thicker sheath, then with more collagen, you're going to get more elastic recoil, but it's going to take more energy to start the movement back and forth. So it's harder for the sperm to reach the egg. Again, here's this tougher layer, makes it stronger. 
but it's going to be harder to move and swim. So they're going to be not as fast, they're going to be slower motility. How do we get more pups? So in some species of the genus Paramiscus, it's a field mouse from around here, but they extend up into Canada and down into Mexico. Uh, the normal average number of litter can be as low as two, and others the average number can be six. And so what could make them have that higher litter size? A good choice would be an increase in FSH, but it could also be an increase in FSH receptors expressed on cells in the ovum. Uh, sorry, the support cells around the ovum. But more FSH produced, so maybe the FSH secreting cells are simply making more of it, create, creating more vesicles of it, and so each binding of a GnRH causes more FSH release. So with more FSH release, we're going to have the same amount of LH, but more FSH, and that additional amount of LH is going to support more follicle division. It's going to trigger more follicles to divide and support more growing. And so with more FSH, we're going to have more follicles developing and more eggs. Now that's a better choice than more GnRH or more LH. More GnRH would also increase the amount of LH. That would cause more estrogen and that would cause negative feedback on GnRH. So you'd get less GnRH over time, less LH and less FSH. Uh, so that would affect both the production of estrogen um, with more LH, you might have earlier ovulation. So there's some additional problems there if you have more follicles. Now that's going to happen to some extent anyway. If you just have more follicle, more follicles, they will produce more estrogen. So that's pointed out here. With more follicles, but the same amount of LH, you've got more cells to produce estradiol. So you're going to have more estradiol. Okay. So more follicles by themselves the FSH by itself is not triggering more estradiol, but with more follicles, more estradiol. That means you're going to have initially more negative feedback on GnRH, so it might slow down the growth a little bit and, and lengthen the ester cycle. But you're also going to wind up with more follicles, you're going to have more cells to produce estrogen, and so at ovulation you're going to have a larger peak of all of these. Finally, uh, pesticides and um, the, so pesticides, and in this case, I, uh, I wanted it to be an agonist uh, for LH, for LH receptors. So here is normal LH binding to its receptors, and here's our pesticide binding to the receptors. So there would be some additional binding, so you're going to have a greater effect of LH or LH-like molecules, more estrogen than normal. And you're going to have, um, therefore, higher amounts of estrogen. Uh, that estrogen is going to do two things. It's going to decrease kispeptin release and GnRH in the early stages of the cycle. So in the early stages of the cycle, you're going to have less of GnRH, LH, and FSH. So that might slow down follicle growth. I also accepted answers looking at what happened later in the cycle. And later in the cycle, with more estrogen produced, you're going to get to positive feedback. This shows kispeptin positive neurons here. You're going to get to, kiss, uh, to that positive feedback cycle earlier. That positive feedback is going to give more GnRH and a larger and faster uh, LH surge and so ovulation is going to happen earlier and it may happen when those ova are still too small, uh, too immature. Higher affinity binding will just speed all that up. So you'll have with high affinity, if they're binding with high affinity, they're going to stay there longer so you're going to have even more estrogen because they're going to continue to stimulate for a longer period of time. Uh, there were two other questions in some versions of the exam. That would be the effect of the pesticide of it on the first half if it was an antagonist, and uh, and if it uh, effect if it was an agonist on mating and pregnancy. So if it was an LH agonist in the first half, we would be blocking normal LH. We'd have less estrogen than normal in that case, 
if it was an antagonist, we'd have less estrogen. We'd have more GnRH and FSH secreted. So that might support more follicles growing, but we're still gonna block the estrogen production. Um, and that would certainly change the timing of the reproductive cycle. So it would delay everything. What about an agonist on mating in pregnancy, an, an LH agonist on mating in pregnancy? So an LH ma on mating in pregnancy, an LH agonist would give you earlier ovulation, that cycle we talked about before here, and earlier ovulation and so therefore earlier mating. In terms of pregnancy, uh, one of the things it would do is potentially block pregnancy if the ova are too small and immature when they're ovulated. There's some other possible effects as well.